Hi, I'm Laura Warren Gross, the librarian at Maple Street. Hi, I'm Stephanie Hampton. I'm a sixth grade English teacher at Maple Street as well. And we both want to welcome you to video number four in our book club series for the summer. Mm -hmm. Remember, we are reading The Parker Inheritance by Varian Johnson. Now, before we even get into anything else in our video today, me and Mrs. Warren Gross want to give you a giant spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. This video is for pages 96 to 245. So just in case you haven't read that far or just in case you're in the middle of that section, um, we just wanna warn you that this week's video is gonna be about those pages. So 96 to 245. Now, if you're just starting the book or if you just um, picked up the book or maybe you're just getting into it, um, we do have tons of resources on our Google Classroom for pages one to 95. So don't you worry, um, you will be able to catch right back up with us. But if you are um, just getting to pages 96 to 245, you may wanna hit pause on this video just to make sure that we don't spoil anything for you. So first things first, we're gonna jump in and we're gonna talk about characters. So in some of our previous videos, we talked about the present day characters. And remind us again, Ms. Warren Gross, about those different page colors that happen in the book. Yeah, so um, we talked in the first video, I think, about how the cover is partially in color and partially in black and white because it's in the present and in the past. So the book does the same thing. Um, if we're talking about chapters that are in the present, they are white pages or sort of sort of regular creamy pages and then there's these light gray pages you can kind of see that and it also tells us who the character is that is being talked about and it gives us dates in history so you can always tell that you're back in time if it tells you the character's name and also the dates and then it's the light gray pages so you can get a feel for it. even if you look at the book on its side you can see those little gray areas so not only did we have all the present characters, but it turns out there's a whole bunch of past characters as well. Mrs. Hampton has some great maps to share with you to help you understand how they all fit together. Well, and it can be a little difficult to kind of keep those characters straight and know what's going on. So me and Ms. Warren Girls work together to make some character maps to help you out. But also with this other layer of history, remember that our historical interactive timeline is available on Google Classroom. So if you want to take charge of your own learning and maybe get curious about different things that happened in history, um, go ahead and check out that um, historical timeline on our Google Classroom and feel free to click and kind of get lost in history. Now, let me go ahead and share my screen so that we can see our character maps. What you guys are looking at on your screen is just a reminder about our historical setting. So remember that we are in the 1950s and 60s in Lambert, South Carolina, and there's two main high schools in this section. So the first high school is Wallace High School, and that is the white high school. And then we have Perkins High School, which is the black high school. Now, these two high schools are really important to understand the different names and the different characters in them, because this is where we get into the tennis match, where um, it's kind of the big deal about the secret at nighttime tennis match that kind of is the climax of our whole story. So keeping these two places in mind. Um, now, just to remind you about our present day characters, and you can see those, right, Mrs. Warren Gross? I can see them. Okay, so remember about our present day characters, and I'm going to go over this a little bit faster because you guys have seen this in previous videos. Um, we have our main character, Candace, and her best friend, Brandon. Um, her mom is Ann Miller, her dad is Joan Miller, and Abigail Caldwell is her grandmother. And this is um, kind of key for this section of reading for 96 to 245, because remember, um, our book opened up with Abigail talking about going on this treasure hunt and not succeeding, not finding it. Now, we have her best friend, well, kind of turns into her best friend, Brandon, supporting character, um, his sister, Tori. Um, his friend Quincy is away. Milo and friends also come into play in this section of the reading. They are the bullies that kind of go after Brandon. Um, we have the mom, Juanita Jones or Mrs. Jones, the grandfather, Mr. Gibbs. And we also meet in the section, Mr. Gibbs's girlfriend, Miss Kathy, and she has some secrets to unfold. Um, some other characters, just to mention some other minor characters that are important to this part of the reading. Um, we have Miss McMillan who is the AP history teacher, and she also runs the memorial room at the school. She helps them out with finding yearbooks and things. We have Ellie Farmer, who is a former student of Perkins High. And remember, going back to that, that setting, 
um, map, kind of think about the different settings. And then we have William Leonard, who's at the end of the section, who's a former student of Wallace High that we kind of meet. Now, those are all of our present day characters. Again, our map will be posted in Google Classroom in case you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Our historical characters are right here. And again, we will post this map for you in Google Classroom. Our main historical character is Siobhan. She's also known as Lil Dub. Um, she is the key to it all. So I put a little key right next to her name. Her dad is Enoch Washington. He's known as Big Dub or Dad or Coach Dub. Her mom is Leanne Washington, um, and you'll find more about Leanne, too, in this section um, with the bake sale at the church. Um, she kind of has two different boys who like her a lot, but one is her actual boyfriend. So Reggie Bradley is her boyfriend, um, and then Chip Douglas um, really likes Siobhan. He actually goes to Wallace High School, um, so he is white. Um, he really likes Siobhan a lot. And his dad, Adam Douglas, works with Big Dub um, on the tennis team. He's the athletic director. So we have these characters over here. Now we have kind of some antagonists um, and some people who cause problems. If you remember antagonists, anti, um, we have coach Thomas Turner. He's the tennis coach at Wallace High School. Um, we have Glenn Allen, who's Reggie's opponent in the tennis match. So we have Glenn and Reggie. Um, Glenn's brother is Marion. Um, he's also key to this section. And then their sister is Penelope. So this is kind of the Allen family, which will become um, even more important as we go along. Now, um, as we talk about the characters, we want to kind of do and remind you about the review in case you need to catch up on pages 1 to 95. So on pages 1 to 95, um, we know that Abigail Caldwell, we start out and we see her tear apart the tennis courts in 2007. We don't really know why she's doing that. But as we continue on, and Can Brandon and Candace, excuse me, meet each other and get to be friends. And in, in doing so, they end up going up into Candace's attic. And in Candace's attic, they find a letter. And that letter, which was sent to many townspeople, and we'll find out a little bit more about that later, that letter led her grandmother on this series of clues to find a treasure. And so we start to get to go back in time. We learn who Enoch Washington is. We learn a little bit about his family that at age six, he was expected to be a sharecropper and plant cotton for somebody. So his family always was in debt and they were never able to get ahead. And we find out that his family actually sent him away to school to try to better his life. So that's how he ended up in Lambert and how he ended up a teacher and how he ended up married to Leanne. So we know kind of Siobhan Washington's origin story, I guess you could say. And then from there, we find out that there are some bullies that are bothering Brandon. And we find out that, you know, Candace sort of becomes his ally for the summer. There's an entire um, map, a flow map of these events in the Google Classroom. So if you need to catch up on 1 to 95, you can click on that in there and kind of make sure that you've got that order of events straight. Now let's cover pages 96 to 245. And again, spoiler alert. So if you haven't read this far and you don't want to be spoiled on anything that happens, um, go ahead and click pause, catch up on your reading, and then go ahead and come back to this video located on the Learning Hub, our Google Classroom, or Kalamazoo Public Schools YouTube channel. So let me go ahead and share my screen again. Is There's a lot going on in this section. We end up, I think, with, I counted seven historical chapters where we get to meet characters and find out all kinds of history. That's why that character map was so important. But going back in time seven different times, as well as getting to see the entire tennis match, I can see that you've put together a flow map, Mrs. Hampton, of sort of what happens in this section. Oh, yeah. And can you see my flow map, Mrs. Warren Gross? I, I can see your flow map, yes. All right. Here we go. Buckle up, guys. Um, as we jump into Chapter 18, um, Candace goes to church with Brandon and they talk to Deacon Draper and you're going to find this happening a lot where they just talk to other people, search out clues, try to find what's going on. Um, and maybe and also a friendly reminder that these books are your books and that you can keep um, maybe tabs along the side or write in them and keep track of the clues and kind of solve the, the puzzle as you read through it, whether this is your first time reading or your second time reading. In chapter 19, um, Candace helps Brandon with Milo's schedule. So she's helping him with that bully problem. They suspect that Chip Douglas might be James Parker. And again, go back to those character maps if you get confused. Now, for the historical chapters, I outlined them in gray so that you can kind of see that we're jumping back into the past. So in chapter 20, we jump all the way back. 
Um, Big Dub leaves a note on Coach Turner's car. So remember, Big Dub is Siobhan's dad, and he leaves a note on Coach Turner, um, the high school tennis coach at Wallace High, um, his car. Coach Turner and the others come to Big Dub's house, and the match is on. It's set. In chapters 21 and 22, um, we're introduced to the poem, I Too Sing America, which we're going to cover in just a little bit. Um, Candace and Brandon go back to Miss McMillan to find some clues. Um, and the assistant principal comes into the office while Candace and Brandon are there without Miss McMillan and thinks that they are breaking in, which could be a really interesting chapter to go over. Um, if you want to have maybe a debate or think about the role of like grownups um, and how maybe they assume that something is happening that maybe it's not. Chapter 23, um, we jump back in time. Big Dub and wife Leanne argue over the tennis match. She thinks it's a bad idea. It's causing trouble, all sorts of things. Um, chapter 24 to 26, Candace and Brandon talk to Miss Kathy. Remember, that's Mr. Gibbs's, Brandon's grandfather's girlfriend. Um, they go talk to Mrs. Farmer. Um, she is a former Perkins High School student. And she actually un, like reveals a giant clue in the section that Candy's um, Candace's bracelet is Siobhan's. So Siobhan Washington. So she's been walking around with this clue on her wrist that she didn't even realize. Chapter 27, um, Chip stops to talk. To, we jump back in time. Um, Chip stops to talk to Siobhan. Um, he admits to liking Siobhan a lot. And then it, he also finds out that she um, doesn't like him in return. She likes Reggie. So we find that out in chapter 27. Chapter 28, Candace and Brandon go to Vickers Park, which is where the tennis match was held. Chapter 29, we jump back in history. Reggie and Siobhan meet in the park for a date. And again, we have that poem referenced again, I Too Sing America by Langston Hughes. Chapter 30. Candace reviews the letter. So again, if you did not mark um, the letter in the section that Mrs. Warren Gross was talking about, feel free to mark that letter and go back because it has all the clues that you need for solving the, the puzzle. Her and Brandon find clues about Leanne Washington's bake sale in that Briggs versus Elliot, which is something that Mrs. Warren Gross linked in our interactive timeline. Now, as we go into our last section for this chapter, I know it's a lot, so you guys are hanging with me. Chapter 31, jumping back in time, the tennis match we're, we're going to cover today. Um, and we do find out that Perkins wins, which causes a lot of different things to unfold and some problems. Chapter 32, Candace finds out they're going to, to move back to Atlanta, so she's going to leave Brandon. Brandon's pretty sad. Um, chapter 34, 33 and 34, or chapter 33, I'm sorry, jump back in time. Um, Big Dub is beaten and attacked pretty badly. Um, Adam, um, Adam Douglas goes to find Reggie because they think he may be next to be attacked. Um, chapter 34, Candace finds James Parker in the Perkins yearbook. I'm going to say that again because it's a key thing. Candace finds James Parker in the Perkins yearbook. Chapter 35, jump back in time. Um, we do find out that Reggie is attacked um, before Adam can find him, but he fought back and took Marion Allen's eye in the process. So Adam sneaks Reggie out of town. He's fearful for his life, and he um, shows him a way to start a new life. And this idea of passing comes up, which we'll talk more about in our group meeting next week. Last section, chapter 36 to 37. Candace calls Mrs. Farmer back. Um, she also calls William Lanyard with James Parker's identity. She knows who it is now. She sees Brandon surrounded by Milo and the other bullies. And we leave the section with Brandon getting hurt. So what did you think of that section, Mrs. Warren Gross? Well, what I thought about it was really that we learned so much. It's interesting that if if um if we didn't as readers have those historical chapters then we wouldn't be able to put together the clues very easily and we start to know maybe a little bit more sometimes than candace and brandon do and then they come back around and we're able to kind of see how they find out what we're being told in the historical chapters so it's kind of an interesting back and forth as i was reading it i thought hmm these historical pages are giving us clues that candace and brandon aren't being told yeah, I totally saw that too. And I, um, I love going back and looking at where those historical events fit in our interactive timeline, because there was a lot of different things going around in history that were not just taking place in Lambert, South Carolina. Yeah, now, our, for sure. 
Yeah, our two other things that we want to talk about today before we let you guys go. Um, I do want to show you the poem, I Too Sing America, um, and go, kind of go over that with you guys in case you haven't seen that poem before. And then Mrs. Warren goes, you're going to read for us about the tennis match so that we know kind of what happens um, at that very big um, climatic moment where we find out kind of the story changes for and kind of unfolds the rest of the story. So um, for our poem, let's do the poem first, and I, I'm going to share my screen. I see your screen. All right. So we have the poem, I Too Sing America, Langston Hughes. Um, he's a poet from the Harlem Renaissance era, and you can learn more about Langston Hughes and the Harlem Renaissance on our interactive timeline. I'm going to read through the poem um, one time full, and then I'm going to maybe leave some clues along the way in case you want to go back. And I will also share um, the poem in Google Classroom. So we have I Too Sing America by Langston Hughes. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Now, this is kind of interesting to think about. And if, even if you don't enjoy looking at poetry, um, it's interesting that Varian Johnson included this poem, not once, but twice um, in the book. So if you look at the, at the book, um, it's first printed on page 124, and Siobhan is, is looking at the poem. And then it comes back, um, it's again on page 184 that it comes back. So I think this may be a giant clue into what's going on. So chapter 35 um, is where this pops up in The Parker Inheritance by Varian Johnson. Um, we have this idea of different shades of, of people colors. So we have, I am the darker brother, which implies that there is a lighter brother. Um, going on and so different shades of, of brown and different shades of people and how maybe um, that can be referenced throughout history. And again, we'll talk about that because they do talk about this idea of passing um, later on in the, in the, in the story. Um, and then we have two different stanzas that go against kind of um, are interesting that complement, but also tell two different, very different tales. So we have the first stanza, the first full one that talks about, I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen, um, referencing servitude, slavery, um, enslavement, that kind of thing, serving um, other people. They um, referencing white people in history. Um, and then tomorrow, I'll be at the table. So joining the table when company comes, nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Um, so we have two different stanzas, one where it's separate and one maybe perhaps where um, Langston Hughes is applying equality. And so um, I'll leave you with this, thinking about what does it mean to be America? And if we could be America, what does that look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? So I'll reference our poem in Google Classroom. And then Mrs. Margot, you're gonna talk about the tennis match, right? I am. So um, chapter 31, which begins on 191, is really, uh, as Mrs. Hampton mentioned, a huge climax in this book. We get to really see kind of what happened. Remember early on um, when I read the letter, or no, Mrs. Hampton read the letter last week, mm -hmm. um, it was mentioned that the Allens ran the Washingtons out of town, but we didn't know why. And we couldn't figure that out. We actually didn't know who they were. But today we're going to find out more. So chapter 31, beginning on page 191, Siobhan Washington, August 10th, 1957. Siobhan readjusted the red scarf around her neck as she and coach Robert Hicks parked outside the Wallace High School tennis courts. She was glad she'd worn a blouse and poodle skirt. It was almost 80 degrees outside, much too hot for the jeans she'd originally planned to wear. Plus, she liked how she looked in her current outfit. Everything from the high heels to the deep red lipstick that matched the scarf. She had wanted to look nice for herself and for Reggie. She didn't know when she'd see him again. A full moon hung high in the sky, illuminating the parking lot. Ahead of them, 10 vehicles sat just outside the chain link fence surrounding the court, including Coach Douglas's Buick and Chip's truck, all of them with their engines running and their headlights on. They must have been using them to provide additional light for the game. Siobhan paused at the door to Chip's, as the door to Chip's truck opened. He stepped out of the cab and began walking toward them. Hello, Coach. 
Chip said, shaking Robert Hicks' hand. Then he nodded toward her. Hey, Siobhan, glad to see you could make it. There's no way I was missing tonight, she said. She turned as another car entered the parking lot. Her body tensed as the vehicle rolled past them and then parked alongside the fence. That's just Reverend Hollister, Robert Hicks said, placing his bear of a hand on Siobhan's shoulder. Let me catch up with him. I'll see you in the stands in a bit. His gaze bounced off, bounced from her to Chip. Don't stand here talking for too long. Siobhan, I'll be sitting with Smitty. They both nodded as Coach Hicks walked to, over to greet the thin white man exiting the car. Her father and Coach Kurt Turner could only agree on one person to serve as an umpire, Reverend Stephen Hollister. He was a pastor of a small Methodist church just outside the city. He was known to be sympathetic to Negro causes. Given the secrecy of the exhibition, he was as close to an Im to impartial as the Perkins team was going to get. But with only one umpire, it would, be would have taken all night for each of the boys to play. So the coaches decided to modify the scoring. The exhibition would consist of three sets. Wallace's top three players against Perkins' best three. Each pair would only play a shortened set, where the first boy to win four games with a two-game advantage would win the set. The team with the best two out of three sets would be the victor. Is the team ready? She asked. Chip picked up some, picked at some grit under his fingernail. As ready as they're going to be. He paused for a moment, staring at the ground, and then he added, your boyfriend plays in the second set. Coach Dub wanted to put in his two best players first. So Chip knew about Reggie too, but she was glad. She was tired of all the secrets, all of the silence. Who's Reggie playing against? Glenn Allen, Chip said, but Reggie can beat him, I think. As long as he stays focused, Chip finally smiled. How is it that I go off to college and you fall head over heels in love with another fellow? It was a surprise to me too. She touched her bracelet. The metal felt cool, even in this hot weather. But I really do love him. He's kind and smart and so good most of the time. She smiled as she thought of Reggie. It felt strange to be saying all of this out loud, but it was also so empowering. She wanted to talk about Reggie to someone, anyone, and since they'd started seeing each other, ever since they'd started seeing each other, I guess you know my daddy doesn't really approve of him. Chip nodded. She tried to read his expression, but it was a clean slate. Maybe in college if you and he... Reggie's not going to college. His grandma had barely has enough money to keep the lights on, much less to send him off to school. What about scholarships? They don't grow on trees. Plus, his grades weren't good enough. He was always working too much to finish his assignments. She took a step forward. For a second, I thought about running away with him. What? Anger flashed across Chip's face. Please don't tell me you're running off with that boy. Don't yell, she said. And Reggie isn't a boy. He's only a year younger than you. <clears throat> Chip seemed to consider this. You're right, he said quietly. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. She nodded at him, letting him know that it was okay. And of course, I'm not going to leave with Reggie. Not because I don't want to. It's just, if I ran away, I'd never be able to come back home. I'd never see mama and daddy or any of my friends. Your daddy would eventually forgive you. Are we talking about the same big dub? She looked toward the court. The cars were blocking her view, but she could hear the sound of the tennis balls bouncing in the background. We should head on in. Chip rubbed the back of his head. Want to sit with us? Better not, she said. Don't want to cause a scene. Imagine that for a minute, Mrs. Hampton. Just the two of them sitting together would be something that would cause a scene. Well, and you have um, something of, of interesting note when we talk about like interracial relationships and, and interracial um, like different schools integrating. You added some really great information on that historical timeline about Loving versus Virginia and, and that kind of thing, too. So if you're interested in learning more about that, check out the timeline. Yeah, you're right. Marion Allen is already riled up. It would just make things worse if he saw you with us. He shook his head. People aren't even forcing us to sit apart, and we're still segregating ourselves. Mm -hmm. I wasn't talking about that, she said. I don't write Reggie to see us together. He doesn't really like you. As Chip smirked, Siobhan rolled her eyes. Don't let that get to your head, Charles, she said. She started toward the gate. Wait here for a few minutes, then you can follow me in. Siobhan caught the sight of Reggie as she entered the fence. He and the other boys stood with her father in the court nearest the stands, softly lobbing tennis balls to one another. They all wore white shorts and white collared shirts. 
Her mama spent the last few nights sewing the school logo onto the pockets. She walked up to the bleachers and took a seat beside Coach Hicks. He sat about halfway up with Mr. Smith and a few other Negroes. Siobhan quickly counted the number of white people in the stands. There were at least 20. Many of them seemed to be friends with Marion Allen. She wondered how many people Marion had told about the secret game. Siobhan glanced toward the court. Reggie had finally caught sight of her. He smiled, giving her a small wave with his racket. Of course, her father noticed this as well. He tapped Reggie on the head, breaking the boy's eye contact with Siobhan. Then he ordered the boys to sit back down. The first set was about to begin. Jackie Harris took his place on the, on the side of the court. A large Wallace player lined up on the opposite baseline. Coach Hicks told her his name, Harold Buckner. Siobhan didn't know him. The only player on the Wallace team she recognized was Glenn Allen. Harold lofted the ball high in the air, then delivered his serve. Siobhan felt herself leaning toward Jackie, really leaning forward as Jackie returned the ball. Tennis matches were always quiet. There was never any of the hooping and hollering you got in football or basketball games. But the silence at the beginning of this game was unlike anything Siobhan had ever experienced. It was like everyone was holding their breaths, waiting for the first point, waiting while the ball bounced between Jackie and Harold, between black and white. One, two, three, four, five times. Eventually, Harold scored the first point against Jackie. Everyone let out a breath. Marion Allen stood up and cheered. The game continued, with Marion letting out a whoop every time Harold scored, and her father nodding in approval when Jackie returned the favor. Harold was good enough to easily win the first two games, but Siobhan noticed how hard he was breathing. He was out of shape and clearly tired by the middle of the third game. Her father must have noticed as well, because after the timeout, Jackie moved to the baseline and played more defensive strategy. Instead of trying to win shots like before, Jackie focused on just keeping the ball in play, forcing Harold to expend more energy chasing the ball around the court, which led Harold to become more tired and, make, and making more errors. Harold, barely even, Harold was barely even trying to move by the end of the last game. Set one went to Jackie, five to three. The boys met at the net. Jackie held out his hand, and after an eternity, Harold gave it a half-hearted shake. Siobhan rubbed her bracelet for luck as Reggie warmed up with his teammate Mordecai. A few feet away, Glenn Allen knocked the balls around with the Wallace player. Glenn wound up, was wound up pretty tightly, Siobhan thought. He was pounding the ball when he only needed to gently return it. His Wallace teammate had to duck to avoid one tennis ball smashing against his draw. Reggie looked loose, but his face was stern. He kept stealing glances at everyone, Glenn Allen, Siobhan, and even Chip. Siobhan saw, saw Chip flash Reggie a thumbs up the next time he glanced in the stands, but Reggie just snorted and went back to trading serves. She shook her head. Chip really didn't have a clue. Keep your eyes open, Coach Chick said to Mr. Smith as the boys returned to their seats. It's about to get real interesting with Glenn Allen taking the court. After a quick discussion with the coaches, Reverend Hollister motioned for Reggie and Glenn to greet each other before the game started. Neither one moved. Likewise, neither coach made any attempt to tell his player to shake hands. Finally, the Reverend shook his head and pointed them to their positions. He threw the ball to Reggie for the first serve. Reggie bounced the ball a few times and called out the score fired and fired the ball at Glenn so hard the boy couldn't return it. 15-0, 30-0, 40-0 game. Reggie looked at the stands toward Mary and Allen and smirked. After switching sides, Glenn served for the next game and started off just as strongly as Reggie with two aces. But Reggie figured out how to return his serve on the next point, eventually bringing the score to 30 all. Then when Reggie earned the lead in the next score, a devastating cross-court shot, he smirked again, this time at Chip. He's way too cocky for his own good, Siobhan whispered. Yeah, but look where he learned it from, Coach Hicks said, nodding toward her father. He had a grin on his face, even larger than Reggie's. Dub jumped up and fist pumped after Reggie won the final point, giving him the second game. The boys switched sides again, but instead of crossing to the opposite ends of the net like before, they crossed on the same side. Reggie whispered something to Glenn as he passed. Glenn responded by ramming him with his elbow. I got to mm. tell you, Mrs. Warren Gross, it's heating up. Like, this is the match where, like, you can tell. And I feel like um, the author did a really good job, like, explaining, like, these boys don't like each other. It's really tense. It's heating up. They're about to just really go at it. 
And it's, it's mm -hmm. getting kind of to a place where maybe it's not safe almost. Yeah. It feels really intense. It's interesting. I, you know, you'd think like, Oh, they're just going to go play tennis, but there's so much of that historical um, things that are built into that, that makes this a really, really intense situation. Yeah. Siobhan tensed up, ready to move. Reggie just laughed. Siobhan closed her eyes and offered up a prayer. She wanted Reggie to hurry and win these last two games, then it would be over. The Perkins team would have proved they could beat the best tennis team in the state, and everyone would go home safely. When she opened her eyes, she saw her father talking to Reggie. Reggie pulled back with a look of shock on his face. Then he smiled and nodded. On Reggie's first serve, he mistakenly double faulted, giving Glenn a 15-0 lead for the game. Siobhan didn't understand it. Reggie was the best server on the team. He never faulted, much less double faulted. On the next point, Reggie was slow to respond to a drop shot and barely crossed the, the drop shot that barely crossed the net, giving Glenn another score. This went on a few more times, and suddenly Glenn Allen had won his first game. Siobhan looked at her father, assuming the steam was about to shoot from the man's head, but Big Dub just sat there, slowly nodding, his hand on his chin. Siobhan realized what was going on. They were toying with Glenn, stretching the match out. They wanted to humiliate him. Glenn began game four with a weak serve. Reggie responded with an even weaker return that bounced into the net. After letting Glenn run up a score of 40-0 to zero in Glenn's favor, Reggie came storming back, showing off the ferocious returns he put aside for the past two games. He surged ahead, easily winning every room winning point. Siobhan took a deep breath. Reggie needed one more game. Reggie, she watched as Reggie glanced at her father. Big Dub pressed his hands together, then slowly pulled them apart. And Reggie lost the next game through a mix of unforced errors and weak backhands. Siobhan was sure everyone could see the farce of this ex that this expedition exhibition had become. That is everyone except Mary and Alan. He kept cheering, getting louder and louder as his brother pulled ahead, only to fall silent and sulk when Glenn began to lose. Finally, Glenn prepared to serve the sixth game. Siobhan saw his father run his hands across his neck in a slicing motion. Reggie grinned, his eyes narrowed, and he turned his attention to his opponent. Glenn served the ball. Reggie knocked it back so fast that Glenn could only watch as the ball bounced past him. As it became clear that Reggie had planned to win this game, Coach Turner tried to argue a couple of the umpire's calls, but even he eventually stopped once the score became out of reach. Glenn glanced nervously at his brother. Then, right before what was sure to be his final serve, Glenn made the grand gesture of pulling a tennis ball from his pocket and placing it on the ground. He went to kick it out of the way, but instead he somehow stepped on it, yelping. He dropped his racket and fell to the ground, my ankle. I think I've sprained it. Interesting, right, Mrs. Hampton? I don't think he was hurt. I think he did it on purpose. Oh, Siobhan rolled her eyes. Sure, it wasn't nice the way Reggie had toyed with him, but that was just delaying the inevitable. Was it so insulting for Glenn to lose to a colored player that he would rather fake an injury? Coach Turner knelt in front of Glenn as Marion rushed over. They helped Glenn to his feet and led him to the bleachers. She was sure Glenn favored the wrong, wrong foot. We need to reschedule the exhibition, Marion yelled. He can't play on a bum ankle. Yeah, another white man yelled. Don't let the game end like this. This ain't fair. Siobhan watched her father and Adam Douglas saunter over to the Reverend Hollister and Coach Turner at the center of the court. Come on, Robert Hicks said, standing. It's time for us to leave. Siobhan frowned. But I promised Big Dub I'd get you out of here the minute things went bad, Coach Hicks said. And that's exactly a what is about to happen. I'll follow you down, Mr. Smith said. See if I can talk some sense into Dub. Look, I didn't make the rules here, Reverend Hollister was saying to Coach Turner once Siobhan, Coach Hicks, and Mr. Smith reached the bottom of the club bleachers. No substitutions. Coach Hicks kept walking past the court toward the exit, but Siobhan paused. Then she slowly inched along the bottom row, trailing behind Mr. Smith. She wanted to get closer so she could hear better. Siobhan, Coach Hicks said, hissed. What are you doing? Ignoring him, she took a seat. Reggie stood a few feet away, but he was too caught up in the conversation to notice her. Either your player forfeits the set, or he goes back there and finishes the game. Reverend Hollister continued, that's final. 
No, we need to reschedule, Coach Turner said. And what? We forget the current score and start all over again? Big Dub shook his head. Come on, Coach. You're a man of integrity. You're a fine one to be talking about integrity with that stunt you just pulled. Coach Turner crossed his arms. And I don't care what the rules are. I am not about to let word get out that we lost to a bunch of colored boys. What exactly are you worried about? Dub asked, his grin widening. Mary Ann Allen? Fine, I'll tell him. Adam Douglas grabbed Dub's arm. Reverend Hollister is the one in charge here. Let's have him make the announcement. He turned to the Reverend. Don't tell him we won. Say they lost because of a forfeit due to injury. But that's a lie, Big Dub said. A win's a win, Adam said. Siobhan looked up as Robert Hicks wrapped his hand around her arm. You've heard enough. He pulled her to her feet. Or do you want me to talk to your daddy about this? Shaking her head, she glanced back at her father. He was talking with the team, a grin on his face so wide and bright. She wanted to call out to Reggie to tell him goodbye, but decided against it. As Siobhan followed Coach Hicks from the court, she heard Reverend Hollister addressing the small crowd. A few people booed, others cursed. Some, someone yelled, them color boys cheated, didn't they? Then she heard a glass, glass smashing against the ground. She whipped back around. Adam, Douglas, and Chip had corralled the Perkins team and was leading them away from the bleachers. A glass bottle had shattered a few feet from them, but none of the boys seemed to be injured. Her father remained on the court, but Mr. Smith was doing his best to pull him away as well. Let's go, Robert Hicks said, grabbing her arm again. This time, he didn't release her until he'd placed her in the car. As she rubbed her arm, she searched for the crowd. Looking, she searched the crowd looking for Reggie. All she saw was a sea of white faces, and all and they all were angry. Oh my gosh, it's about to get crazy, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. That's I was not. It's interesting, the secret tennis game. When I first read this book, I was not expecting it to become so quickly so bad. Like, yeah. you think, okay, they're going to play tennis and it's going to be fine. And the next thing you know, like, they have to usher them out and glass bottles are being thrown and you just know something bad, bad is coming. Yeah, so it, it kind of goes crazy from here. And this, this tennis scene that you just read for us again, even if you've read the book before, it's important to kind of go back and see the different things that have happened because... You can kind of talk about the player interactions and what happens afterwards. And, and again, for the historical pieces of this book, it kind of goes crazy from here. So um, that concludes video number four for our book club series, Mrs. Warren Gross. Yep. So this video might go a little bit over a half hour. We normally meet at 1130 on Tuesdays. We'll meet at the end of the video. So it might be a little bit more like 1140, but we'll still plan to be in Google Classroom on our meet with you um, after this video premieres on Tuesday. And we can't wait to hear what you think of when you find out about Charles Parker, when you see what happens after the tennis match. There's so many interesting things that happen in this section. And we can't wait to hear what you think. Yeah, so we'll see you guys um, in, our, in our Google Meet session after this. And then stay tuned for our next video for video five next week. Thank you guys for coming. Have a great week.